The Story Without a Name, Chapter 1, by Barbie de Overly, translated by Edgar Saltus. One day, just prior to the French Revolution, in a village at the foot of the Savenay, between vespers and evening service, a capuchin was preaching. The church was dim, and the dimness was heightened by the mountains that surrounded it, which embraced it, and which about the ulterior houses rose sheerly into space. The descent was a circular pathway, twisted like a corkscrew. The mountains were very green. There were rushing streams with silver bubbles, and trout so plentiful that you could catch them with the hand. But in regard to the situation, no village was ever more desolately placed. A man's birthplace is like his mother. He is supposed to love her whether she is worthy or not. Were it otherwise, human beings to whom the open is a necessity could never have remained in a pit such as that. Merely the desire to breathe would have sent them over the mountain walls. I lived there nearly a month. During that time I was like a crushed titan, physically overwhelmed by the impression which these mountains gave. Even now, in thinking of them, I feel their weight on my heart. The inhabitants reminded me of miners living in the under-earth, and again of those captives of earlier cloisters who prayed year in, year out, forgotten in shadowy crypts. As for the village, I might compare it to a pen sketch in China ink, a collection of old houses blackened by age, but it possessed a peculiarity of its own. The blackness became blacker, a black on black, one in which the perpendicular shadows of those enveloping heights increased. It resembled nothing so much as a prison where light never enters, where the walls are too steep for the sun to scale. Sometimes, at high noon, I could not catch a glimpse of day. It is a place where Byron should have written his darkness. It is a place where Rembrandt might have created that effect of his, the absence of light, or rather, it is there that he could have found it. In summer, when the inhabitants look up at the blue garret windows that hang a thousand feet above them, they are not wholly sure whether the day is fair or not. On this particular day, however, the window was not blue, it was gray. Clouds had closed the aperture. The bottle was corked. The entire population was then at church, an austere edifice built in the 13th century in which the somber twilight aiding, not even lynx eyes, had there been any, could have read a word of the prayers. As is customary, the candles had been extinguished at the beginning of the sermon, and the congregation, huddled together like tiles on a roof, were invisible to the preacher as he, separated and afar in the pulpit, was invisible to them. But though they could not see very clearly, at least they could hear. It is only in the choir, runs the proverb, that capuchins talk through the nose. The capuchin who was preaching then had a voice which was not alone vibrant, but resonant enough to announce the most terrible dogmas of the church. He was then announcing them. He was preaching of hell. Everything about the church, the severity of the style, the approach of night that entered in waves, profounder and more insistent each moment, lent to the speech of the speaker an extraordinary relief. The statues of the saints, veiled in the draperies with which they are covered during Lent, were like mysterious phantoms, motionless in their niches, and the preacher, whose indistinct silhouette swayed across the white column against which the pulpit leaned, seemed a phantom also. You would have said a specter preaching to ghosts. Even the thunder of his voice, powerful in its actuality though it was, and yet which appeared to no one, seemed to fall from above. The impression of it all was so thrilling, the attention so great, the silence so absolute, that when, for a moment, he stopped to draw breath, you heard from without the sob of rillets trickling along the mountainside, adding to the melancholy of the shadows, the melancholy of waters displaced. The eloquence which the preacher displayed must surely have been heightened by the ambient influences that I have described. In listening to it, every ear was turned, every head was bowed save two, the heads of a mother and daughter. That evening, after the sermon, the preacher was to sup with them. They were curious to see him, and they bent forwards in an effort to catch a glimpse of the ghost lost in the penumbra of the arch. It may be remembered that, in those days, Strangers, members of some distant order, preached during Lent throughout the parishes of France. These wandering servants of God, the people with the unconscious poetry which is theirs, called Swallows of Lent. 
and when one of them alighted in a hamlet or a city, a nest that was made for him in the foremost mansion of the place, a form of hospitality which rich and religious households gratefully dispensed, and which, in the provinces where life is monotonous, lent a particular interest to the preacher, who each year brought with him that aroma of the unknown and the far away which the isolated loved to inhale. The most rapid seductions of the chronicles of love recount are the most accomplished by travelers who have merely passed and of whom that passing constituted the unique attraction. The monk who was fulminating then on the terrors of hell hardly seemed apt to sow anything else than the fear of God. And as he fulminated, he did not know, nor did the two women who were trying to catch a glimpse of him know, that the hell he preached was about to leave in their hearts. But that evening, as they left the church, their pardonable, if provincial, curiosity was unsatisfied. They had not caught a glimpse of the terrible preacher of the terrible creed, and concerning him they had no remarks to make, except regarding his ability, which seemed to them to be very great. As they wrapped themselves in their furs, they told each other that they had never heard a better sermon. Both were fervent believers, and both, according to their sacramental expression, pious as saints. They were called the Ladies de Ferjol. That evening, they returned home quite animated. Heretofore, during Lent, they had seen and entertained many a preacher. There had been Premontres, Gunnafans, Dominicans, and Judas, but never a Capuchin, never. No one of that mendicant order of St. Francis, of which the costume, and costumes always more or less preoccupy women, is so poetic and picturesque, had ever passed that way. Madame de Ferjol, who had traveled, had seen it before, but her daughter, who was only sixteen, knew no other capuchin than the one in the corner of the mantel in their dining room, which served as a barometer, the charming, old-fashioned barometer, which, like so many charming things, exists no more. The monk, who presently caused himself to be announced, and who then entered the room where the ladies awaited him, did not in the least resemble the capuchin that hooded himself in stormy weather and unhooded himself in fair. He was of a different type from the one invented by the charming imagination of our fathers. In the France of olden time, even in days of faith, there was much hilarity over both priest and monk, but especially over the latter. Later, in a less fervent epic, the wicked and witty regent who laughed at everything said to a capuchin who calls himself unworthy of his calling, But what the deuce are you worthy of if not worthy of being a capuchin? The 18th century, which disdained history as Mirbeau did, a disdain that history will repay as it has already repaid Mirbeau, forgot that Charles V had been a capuchin, and during its entire span covered the order with ridicule and epigram. The capuchin who appeared that evening before the ladies de Ferjol was manifestly not made for either ridicule or epigram. He was about thirty, tall, robust, imposing. He wore a short beard curled like that of Hercules, rather dark, the color of bronze. The world admires pride, and his expression, which asked no indulgence because of his cloth, had in it nothing of the voluntary humility of his order. Neither had his attitude. Merely in stretching his hand, he had the air of one commanding respect. And what a hand it was! A hand so superb that the whiteness of it, issuing from the wide sleeve, startled. A hand royally beautiful that stretched imperially for alms. As is customary in the homes of the devout, the servant, a goth thousandth by name, had already given him water for the feet, and they now shone in their sandal like marble, sculptured by Phidias. To the ladies he bowed very distantly, after the oriental fashion, the arms crossed on the breast, and as he bowed, no one, not even Voltaire, would have jested at him. The red buttons of the cardinalate were never to star his robe, but he looked worthy to bear them, and as the ladies curtsied, it occurred to them that the voice that they had heard falling from the pulpit through the increasing shadows of night was exactly suited to this man. It being Lent, and this priest of abstinence having come to represent and preach it, they offered him the usual Lenten repast. String beans, cooked in oil, celery salad, beets mixed with anchovies, tuny fish, and stewed oysters. Therewith was a bottle of Chateau de Pape, and that, though it was a Catholic wine, he refused. Of the food, however, he ate heartily, and to his hostesses he seemed 
while devoid of affectation, fully possessed of the dignity and severity of his cloth. The hood, which on entering the room he threw back on his shoulders, disclosed a neck that might have belonged to a Roman proconsul, and an enormous cranium polished as a mirror and circled with a coronet of hair, which was bronzed like his beard and curled as it. The members of his order, who are mendicants in the name of Christ, are never anywhere out of place, religion having placed them on the footing of equality with the notables of the earth, and his manner was that of one accustomed to the best of society. In spite of this, he was not sympathetic to either of his hostesses. To their thinking, he was lacking in the affable simplicity which other priests who had been their guests had displayed. He was imposing, and yet he indisposed. He made them uncomfortable, ill at ease, though how or why they were unable to decide. In the chill of his eyes, in the expression of his mouth, there was an audacity, startling and significant. He looked like a man of whom you'd say, he's capable of anything. One evening, when a sort of familiarity had sprung up between him and the gentlewoman, Madame Frajol, who had been scrutinizing him from beneath the shade of the lamp, murmured furtively, Father, I wonder what you would be if you were not a priest. Apparently the remark amused him. He smiled, but what a smile. Madame Frajol never forgot it, and later it stabbed her heart with a horrible conviction. As a matter of fact, his physiognomy was little in harmony with the humility of his calling. Yet during the forty days which he passed in the house, and in spite, too, of the remark that involuntarily had escaped her, Madame Frajol had not a fault to find with him. In speech, in bearing, in everything, he was irreproachable. He would be better off in La Trappe than in a monastery, Madame Frigeau said to her daughter when they were alone and the conversation turned on the monk and the audacity of his expression. For La Trappe, because of the silence which is observed there, and the severity of its regulations is, in the opinion of the world, particularly adapted to those who have a crime to expiate. Madame de Frigeau was gifted with great penetration, and although for years she had been highly devout, yet the benevolence that religion inculcates in no wise prevented her from exercising her penetration, which parenthetically was that of the woman of a world. She was intelligent, quite able to appreciate the eloquence which Father Rickolf displayed, a medieval name that fitted him perfectly, and yet the eloquence attracted her as little as did the man. It was the same way with her daughter, whom the eloquence frightened. To the two gentlewomen, the eloquence and the man were equally distasteful, so much so that they did not confess to him. The other women of the village fairly doted on him, and during the entire time he was among them, his confessional was thronged. His hostesses were the only ones who remained away, an abstention that surprised their neighbors. But at church, as at home, these ladies seemed to have discovered about him a mysterious and isolating circle, and at the circumference of the circle, they stopped. It may be, through the intuition which we all possess, they divined that he was inimical to their happiness.